today for this lesson entitled white supremacy how did we get there right um and what i want to do is i'm gonna open up with with the what they call new testament reading first and then and then the old testament reading right so let's go to james yakub right um and we're going to go to yakub i think it's four i want I think it's four, Yakub four, or James four for those say who's Yakub? <laughs> uh James four. And as soon as I get there. And verse one. They're gonna start right there. James four and verse one. I might try to see if I can switch that around. Let's see what I got. I got my box. I got a couple of things in this. I might no, you know, I am not going to bother with it. I'm just gonna let, let let it flash and it'll be it'll be it'll be over. Okay. I think I have I have the camera in the wrong USB slot because it, I it's a bunch of conversions going on to be able to make the camera work. But so let's just go ahead. So James. Chapter four, reverse one through. Let's keep reading. Mm -hmm. All right. From whence comes wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence even of your lusts that war in your members? Ye lust and have not. Ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet ye have not because you ask not. Ye ask and receive not, because you ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lusts. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with Yah? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of Yah. Do you think that the scripture saith in vain, the Ruach that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, Yah resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to Yah. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to Yah, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted, and mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of Yah, and he shall lift you up. Speak not evil one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother, and judgeth his brother, speaketh evil of the law, and judgeth the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. That's good. You nice and clear today. You're louder than me. Let's see. Y'all can hear the reader though, the dab. Y'all can hear the reader. And, uh, <laughs> that's good though. That's good. That's good. Real good. Okay. Uh, let's see. Let's go ahead and now the reason why I opened up that because we close the book now and go home. Because the hold on, I'm listening to myself, it's throwing me off. We can close the book and go home because the lesson is entitled White Supremacy. How did we get there? Right? And the answer to the riddle is what? The flesh. Mm -hmm. It's lust and desires. Right. <laughs> it's the flesh. Because, and I want y'all to want y'all to uh like and share this video because for some reason or other they don't like to share stuff and we we talk we we tell the truth, we tell it like a T I T is mm -hmm. right. And we give you a little bit of everything in this stream. We give you scriptures, we give you history, we give you politics, the whole nine yards. I cover it all, right? We cover it all on this channel. So now we got lit elections coming up. 
elections coming up. I said elections. <laughs> and you got the Democrats versus Republicans and all of that stuff going on. And this one, that one, right? The bit, the war is the flesh, right? It's too much flesh, too much pride, right? So if you don't look like me, if you don't act like me, right? We look at the corporate system, right? The corporate system is not set up to be appealing to all nations. Mm -hmm. Is set up to be appealing to one nationality of people. That is really not one nationality. That's why we're doing this lesson of history of white people. Because there's no such thing as white people. There is no unification of whiteness because that it don't exist. Because they're all nations, tribes, and tongues, right? Now, let's go. To Genesis, right? Genesis, and let's do it this way. Okay, nations, tribes, and tongues. T O N G U E S, right? Mm -hmm. Nations, and tribes. Okay, that's not what I want. It's the first. Just bear with me a second. I'm going to go there. Nations and tongues. Okay. Okay, two places, two, two things. Okay. Before we go to the Old Testament, before we go to Genesis, let's go to um, let's go to Revelation, right? Revelation, because see, Yah is not a respect of persons like man is. See, when a person puts a person down to put themselves up, it's because they have they they are insecure. They have low self esteem, and to make themselves feel good, they got to pull somebody else down or degrade somebody or denigrate somebody so they can feel good about themselves, right? That's an insecure person, right? So it's like, I'm going to get personal here a little bit. Women are like this. You ever go somewhere, and as soon as you walk in the room, you feel everybody looking at you. They look at you from head to toe. And then they just, they give you this look. I can't stand her. They don't even know you. Right? Mm -hmm. Why is that? <laughs> <laughs> Why do you feel that? But some of y'all, y'all women, talk to me. It'd be interactive this morning. We we gonna get over into it. We we give you all this history of this white supremacy, where it came from. Sometimes it's it's jealousy that they haven't dealt with, you know, their own insecurities or what they wish they look like, and and like you said, the root of it is their own insecurities. Insecurity because. Whoever I am, how is it taking anything away from you? That's right. And that's so. That's what this what the text was saying. Where from whence come wars and fightings among you, right? People like to believe that it's things on the outside, but it's always stemming from something within, right? So that's a character of the of the flesh, right? Because the flesh. There's no good in it that dwells in the flesh. None. Flesh is not going to say, you look nice. Or it, huh, go ahead. I can really say only, uh, only unless you have disciplined your flesh <laughs> or <laughs> beat it into submission and subjection that it won't act out like that. Right. You denying it or checking those unyali desires or right. cravings or attributes when they come up. But then that would make you spiritual then. That's what spirituality is. Because flesh, there is no good in the flesh. The flesh is, is just, it responds to, it's like an instinct. 
Mm -hmm. Right? But when you bring the flesh under control, is you're operating under your spiritual, your true you. Yeah, yeah. I'm not, see, when people think of spirit, they think it's feeling mm, spirit. Spirit is, is, maybe we'll do a lesson on the spirit. Spirit is that which is eternal. Spirit never dies. That's why in Christian doctrine, they say, my love is up in heaven, looking down, smiling. Because from a technical standpoint, they're right, but they're wrong because that person is not in a conscious. See, when a person is a person, they're conscious. They're in, uh, they are in the ability to respond to surroundings, mm -hmm. right? So in the spirit world, right? Spirit world is not a feeling. Spirit world is something that it's like air. Yeah. Breath is eternal. Right. As long as you have breath, right. you're breathing, you're alive. Right. The breath leaves you, but right. the breath is still eternal. Right. It just has left you. Right. So spirit is more natural than flesh. Right. Because animals don't operate by flesh. They operate by spirit. Nature and spirit. This is a lesson going a whole nother direction. But nature and spirit, right, go hand in hand. Because when, when the weather pattern changes, nature responds. Flesh don't. I don't believe it's going to snow. <laughs> and we don't make the necessary preparations and then here come the snow. We get dumped on and now we stuck at home with no food, no water, no electricity, whatever. Animals already know. They operate in the spiritual realm because they know that, here's an easy way to put it, being spiritual is being sense-led. Right? Not senses, but spiritual. Spiritual perception. You operate in what you know, not in what you feel. Flesh operates in what you feel. Mm -hmm. Spirit operates in what you know. You know it's a storm coming. I don't feel like going to the store. That's the flesh. Spirit said, I better go to the store and stock up because I might not be able to get to the store. That's spirit. Right? So when a person is in the flesh, like that person sees another person, the flesh will become jealous because I'm the wonderful one here. You can't come here looking better than me because if you come in here looking better than me, I'm going to tear you down so I can feel on top. That's why the modeling industry is a dangerous industry, right? Because they teach you. It promotes you to want to be better than everybody else. Want to be vain. <laughs> and that right there is the root of white supremacy because white supremacy, we're going to get to it in a minute, has its origin in this one particular study of, of, of anthropology, right? The study of the human skull, right? A race of people or a, let me say it this way, not race, a, using Josiah's word, a dynamic of people that were left out for many years and don't have a history because of their insecurity and them not having a history, they have strategically took everybody else's history and placed it on them as if it's their history. That's flesh. Flesh will never admit the truth. Flesh will continue to carry a lie out because it's flesh. When you're spiritual and somebody brings something to your attention and say, what you believed it's not quite accurate. Flesh is all. I've been believing this my whole life. I know I'm right. That's flesh. But spiritual person said, hmm, why do you say that? 
Can you elaborate a little bit on why you say you believe that I believe this, that, and the other? Right? So, spiritual person is going to hear matter out. A fleshly person is going to, if they don't, if it doesn't fit their narrative, it doesn't fit what they believe, they're going to cut it off, period. I don't, I don't want to hear it. That's why you had this bumping of heads with people who, I'm raised a Christian. You in a cult. Why? Because it goes against what you believe. In regards to what facts or truth that you bring out, right? Because it goes against what I believe. That's why a person, a person that's studying or researching to prove what they believe or to support what they believe is dangerous. Because they, it's like this, the archaeologists, when they went and they into Africa and places in the so-called Middle East, and they found these skulls that didn't look like the beautiful skull. <laughs> <laughs> they lied, or they just never. They just didn't elaborate on the truth. What they discovered or they'll take scholars that made statements that disagrees with their thesis and say well they didn't really was talking about it. why because that's flesh but spirit is open to truth a person that spiritual seeks truth they don't get that their feelings don't get hurt when you're spiritual you want to be better. You want to be the best that you can be in life because that's why you're here. You're not here to be, you know, going through the motions and having feelings. You're here to be the best you. So it might hurt your feelings. Sometimes our feelings need to be hurt so we can be our best. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So the origin of white supremacy is all based in the flesh. My flesh is because I was behind because I don't have a history, right? Now, I want to take your history and make you feel like that you are from another creation. We're going to read that today, right? A couple of, they wrote, the, wrote it in books to say that you Negroes are apes, right? It came from you didn't come from Adam. <laughs> All right. Now, so with that said, let's go to. Um, you said Revelation, but you never said. Yeah, Revelation. Let's go to. Let's go to Revelation 10, 10 and 11. Right. And let's just read. Let's read. Let's read that one verse. Uh, let's see. Let's read. Let's read 8, 9, 10, and 11. Okay, this is relevant to the lesson. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. And verse 8. Mm -hmm. And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again mm -hmm. and said, Go and take the little book right. which is open in the hand of the angel, right. which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. Right. And I went unto the angel and said unto him, right. give me the little book. Right. And he said unto me, take it and mm -hmm. eat it up mm -hmm. and it shall make thy belly bitter, mm -hmm. but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. Mm -hmm. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up. Right. And it was in my mouth sweet as honey. Right. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. Mm -hmm. And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. See that? So he said, you are going to prophesy again before many who? Not races. Peoples, nations, tongues and kings but notice what he said the 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 book he told him to eat the book <laughs> and when he ate the book he said his belly was bitter right what is that significant of you're being spiritual you tell him it like a ti tis 
right? If it goes against your religious views, views, if it goes against your religious upbringing, right? When you are spiritual, if it goes against your camp doctrine, oh my goodness, that's when you're spiritual because everybody else is teaching it must be right. You can't read that in the book, but your camp teaches that Esau is the white man, which is the biggest lie ever been told. Be ready for that lesson. I'm going to give you some smidgens of that because I'm going to write my book. Y'all going to buy my book. It's going to be number one seller because I'm not going to give all my nuggets out on YouTube. Okay. Most I said to me this week, give them to me, give them to me your nuggets out. That's your, your livelihood. Give, just give enough and let the people do what they got to do, right? The information and the knowledge that the Most High blessed me with, and I say this in all humility, you don't get this in university. I spent time, hours reading and studying, and I, only, I barely could just skim the surface of the stuff I read. If I was to spend a whole day sharing stuff that I read out of the books, revealing truths and stuff like that, it would bust a lot of people's head wide open. <laughs> I read stuff and I, I have a, uh, I utilize and utilize Google, Google slides and Google docs when you read something and save it, create a document. I have a, I have a slide called, uh, quotes from books. It could be on any subject, right? If I read a book and I see, I'm like, oh, wow, it's not even on a subject I'm studying, but it's something that's relevant, something that's powerful. I cut and paste it and I put it in my Google Slides and I title it and I put the name. Uh, some of y'all, sometimes y'all see it on the screen when I do it. I put the name of the book down, uh, the author, the date, and the page where I got it from because later on I'm like, where did I read that at? Google Slides has helped me to be organized, right? Okay. So now, with that said, the Most High told, who is this he's talking to? This Yachanan, right? He told him that he would prophesy before many people, not many Israelite people, right? Many people, right? People is the Hebrew word am, right? If you got an am somewhere, you a people. Am Erica, right? Mm -hmm. Am means people, right? In the Hebrew tongue, am means people. Ad am. <laughs> Ad means, it's, it, even in the English language, means what? Was add me, add, add, a d d, a d d, add. Oh, addition, right? Plus, continue more, right? There's no end. So the name add am means add means a continuous am people. So when the Most High may add am. He may add am, in other words, a perpetual people. He created people to live forever and not die. Mm -hmm. And the way in which we continue to live forever is by following the manuscript for life. See, we look at the Bible as a religious book. I can teach principles out of the Bible and, and never open the Bible. Because the Bible is full of principles for life. But the enemy has tricked us into using the Bible as a religious book. And that's why people reject it. But even atheists live by principles. They just don't believe in the Bible. They believe in the principles. The principles that came from the Bible. That came from the creator. Right? All right. So the most I told him. To go before peoples, right? To go be prophesy before peoples, nations, and tongues, and kings. Now that right there ought to tell you. If Yachanan was instructed to go before people, nations, tongues, we're going to pass that. 
kings. How many Hebrew kings do we have today? Israelites. Do we have one? <laughs> so that lets us know that Yachanan is going to prophesy before kings who have lands. So this can't be just Israel only. Because Israel only is a flesh doctrine. Let me say that again. I forgot to put my reverse on, on my body. I re reconfigured things. That's why stuff is jumping. Um, my other computer is on the verge of crashing, so I had, I had to get a replacement. So I'm using a replacement computer. And I didn't have a chance to get it set up properly, but we'll get it together. Okay. Um, you said Israel only. Right. Israel only is a flesh doctrine because the Most High gave, made a command, right, with man, not with one particular tribe, right? That's why I pulled this out. He said, you must prophesy uh, before people, nations, tongues, and kings, right? Now, uh, I want to go to 11, Revelation, Revelation 11 and 9. Let's read that because we are breaking down where this white supremacy came from. All the laws that govern the nations are established and set up by the flesh to keep a certain people on top. Mm -hmm. That's the flesh. And you're going to be in church tomorrow praising Jesus. But still at the same time, enforcing and creating laws to keep you on the top. Okay. Now, Revelation 11, 9. Go ahead. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half. Right. And shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. Right. That's good. So, remember he told John, prophesy to people, nations, and tongues. Now, these two prophets prophesying before people, kindreds, tongues, nations. Now, when he said prophesy, it, it didn't mean that everybody going to receive it. See, that's flesh. Flesh wants you to be received. Spiritual person said, I'm going to drop it like it's hot. Let the chips fall where they may. Whoever embraces it, whoever hears it, whoever takes it and, and runs with it, hallelujah. Whoever rejects it, it ain't for you. At this time, maybe later, but right now I ain't for you. I'm not going to lose no sleep because you rejected what Yah gave me to share. When you're a prophet of Yah, you ain't worried about what people are going to say when you speak. If Yah gave you something to say, you're going to say it. Then you might hug him after you get fed. Tell him what Yah said. Okay, come on, give me a hug. <laughs> I feel better. I said what Yah said. <laughs> it might have hurt your feelings, but look. It wasn't me. That was y'all. I had to say what y'all gave me to say. Now, come on, let's go out and eat. <laughs> right? That's how you do it. They might not. I don't want to go out and eat with you. They might get mad because you tell them the truth. But, hey, if you're spiritual, you're going to respond in the spiritual manner and not in a fleshly manner. Fear is not spiritual. Fear is a feeling. Fear is flesh. Fear is uncertainty. When y'all speak something to you and you afraid to share it, it's because you are either uncertain that it was y'all or you just in the flesh and you're afraid people are going to reject you. Baruch Shabbat to you, uh, Adaya. Good to see you. And, um, Kima, uh, Terry. Okay. Now, see, it's lessons like this that don't pop, is not popular with people because people want to stay in the flesh. 
no flesh shall be esteemed in his sight. Right? All right, now let's go another level here. Let's go to Revelation 17. This this is not not in my notes. This is what the Ruach is taking me. I'm gonna go here and then we're gonna get into some secular stuff. And we're gonna we're gonna wrap up this, this series. Okay, now. Let's go back a little bit. <laughs> Let's go up to um This is deep. Uh, I hate to do this, but we're going to go here and go out. But this is a whole lesson in itself. So let's start at Revelation 17, verse 8. It's talking about the beast. Matter of fact, let's, uh, okay, no, let's go at 8. Okay, let me just give you, let me just give you a um, uh, synopsis. Okay, let's talk about the great whore, right? That is going to be judged in the last days. And the great whore comes in many facets, it's not just religious, it's government, right? Okay, so the spirit, um, man is going to be judged, right? Man's government is going to be judged, man's ruler is going to be judged, right? Man's religion is going to be judged, right? All of that is part of the system that came from Satan, who is... The red dragon who empowered the people of the prince, which is the seed of the serpent, which is red. Okay. All right. Red is the blood without the blue. That's a whole nother lesson. <laughs> but let's go. Revelation 17. All right. Good. The beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit right. and go into perdition. Right. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life right. from the foundation of the world right. when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. Right. And here is the mind which have wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. Right. And there are seven kings, five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth, and of and is of the seven, and goeth into perdition. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. Mm. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the lamb and the lamb shall overcome them. For he is Yah of Yahs, master of masters and king of kings. And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. That's good. What verse was that? That was verse 14. 14. Okay. Now, so this is the judgment of the great whore. Let me say this here as a prophet. They that are in the flesh will be judged. It's a prophecy. And I didn't have to go and feel no feeling and Jake and do the hemojimas <laughs> because when y'all said something that's it it's a wrap right so that's what this is about this is about people that don't want to submit to y'all's spirit is in the flesh no matter how good of a person you might be they that are in the flesh cannot please y'all that's what that means exactly when you walk in the spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh, right? So the, the whore is going to be judged. Now, the verse says here, right? Who's going to be judged, right? Verse 17, 8 says, The beast that thou saw and is not shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition, right? So we're talking about these 10 toes, right? Uh, now, it says, 
They that dwell on earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life, right? When they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. That's talking about the world power. That's talking about this group of people who have embraced the label called whiteness. Okay? I'm gonna make I'm gonna bring it home. I'm gonna make it so clear that the goats can get it. Right? Now, so when you see he talks about verse nine. Look at verse nine again. Here is the mind which have wisdom. The seven heads are the seven mountains on which the wind, the woman sits. The seven mountains doesn't have nothing to do with Rome. Doesn't have nothing to do with Rome. Let me say that again. That's what Christianity taught you. The seven mountains has nothing to do with Rome. One more time. The seven mountains has nothing to do with Rome. Seven day Ventus are absolutely 100% emph uh, um, emphatically wrong. It has nothing to do with Rome. Has everything to do with the seven world powers, because it's, it, it explains it right in the whole, right in that same verse. It has everything to do with the seven world powers, right? That ruled over Israel. This connects with Daniel and Daniel's vision of the image of the beast and the people of the prince that came came under the new label, that's why they can't be Esau, called whiteness. What do the Gentiles have in common? From Nebuchadnezzar to Medes and Persians to the Greeks to the Romans to the Ten Toes, right? Ten nations, right? The revived Roman Empire, right? Okay. What do they have in common? A couple things that comes yeah. to mind. <laughs> but the specific thing I was thinking about was the label called whiteness. Okay. What what's some other things you could think of that they have in common? Mm -hmm. Uh, still people's lands, still history. people's lands, still people's history. Yeah, right. All the above, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They have their mindset toward other nations and feeling. Watch this now. This is watch this now. This is deep. They even took the color of Esau, and they even staged. And they even wrote it in books to have. We, we, we'll read this in another lesson. David wrote in books that Esau was Rome and got Hebrew Israelites teaching that. When in fact, Rome and, and the so-called white man is Gog. We read that two weeks ago. Man told the truth. How they stole the lands and all of that, right? Y'all need to go back and watch that lesson. It's still out there. I didn't put it in the memberships. Even though some of y'all haven't given no contributions and some have never given any contributions, that's okay. It's all right. Go to the restaurant, eat and walk out and don't pay. See how that works. But anyway, I digress. Um, so the seven heads, right, are the mountains of which the woman sits. So the woman is the red people, not Esau. Right, because the red people took Esau's, <laughs> took Esau's late. Right, in a nutshell, Esau is still black today. Right, we're gonna prove that in a future lesson and in my book. Esau is not white in no form, fashion, or shape, stretch of the imagination. Okay, some of them might look white because of some mixture, but as a whole nation, Esau is not the white man. It's a false doctrine. Incorrect. Incorrect. Absolutely, one hundred percent. 
Incorrect. I like Dr. Michael Brown's line. 100% false, not true. <laughs> okay, right? Um, so going back in, so we got the seven heads, seven mountains on which the woman sits. Now he's going to amplify this. So you won't say, oh, because I told us that the seven mountains is, is not wrong, right? But he didn't break down and explain to us. Watch this now. Stay right with us now. The seven kings. Ah, we're getting on to something now. See, the seven kings. So the seven heads had seven kings, right? Five are fallen. One is, and, and the other is not yet come, which is the, 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 the I got to be careful how I say this because copyright claims is coming at me. The next president of the United States in the upcoming election is going to fulfill this. Okay. That's the one, the seventh. Go back and look at the here. Talk about kings now, kingdoms. Not mountains as far as to hills, the seven mountains of Rome. Jerusalem has seven mountains too. Okay, so the seven kings, five are fallen, one is, one is not yet. And when he comes, he must continue a short space, right? Now, here it is right here. It breaks down. The beast that was and is not. Even he is the eighth. <laughs> what is eight symbolic of? Right? We have tabernacles, right? We have what? We have seven days and then we have the eighth day. Convocation. Eight is symbolic of the new beginning. So, the beast that had power was the one that started a new world order, right? A new beginning which unifies the whole planet, right? That's why these wars are happening now, because this beast wants to unify the whole world under his power. I'm going to say that and I'm going to leave it just like that. And you can Google it and you can run with it and you can pray about it and all of that and, and, just, and just let your mind go where the Ruach is taking you with that. All right? Now, so he, right, is the eighth and is of the seventh and goes into perdition, right? What is perdition? <laughs> Lawlessness. So inclusive of this whore is all of their daughters. That's why seven day Adventists can't be the answer because they are a daughter of this woman. And all of the, the, the prophets and the people who gave you that doctrine are still in perdition because why? What is the primary teaching of Christian church? Right? Not under the law. Now they might say, well, we keep the ceremonial law. I mean, we keep the, the moral law, but not ceremonial law. Okay? Do you really believe that? They say they do. Do you really believe that? We can question that. I had some friends that were Seventh-day Adventists and found out that they, they, they swine, don't they? <laughs> some of them do, but they don't teach that it's a, it's a transgression, uh, from my experience. Now, if they change, some might correct me. I stand corrected. But I had a minister friend. He was Seventh-day Adventist. He didn't eat pork, but they didn't teach that it was a sin. To eat it. Okay. All right. So going back in. So you got the the people in kings of tongues. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm looking at the wrong place. 
so here here is now verse 12 breaks down the 10 horns which thou saw are 10 kings right now the 10 kings are are this is where the white creation of the white race began right here with the 10 kings you can, you're not gonna get this in the book but it's been there and this is what the ruah how the ruah has has brought it out. These 10 kings are the ones who formulated your modern European system. Right? Now, let's go back in. He says, so the horn, the 10 horns, which you saw are 10 kings. So now we, now we have, we have, uh, seven, Mounts, seven mountains, which are seven kings, and then now we have ten horns, which are ten kings, right? So horns are smaller than mountains, right? Which means that the mountains were world powers, right? Notice now, the world powers, all of them are still called beasts, but the world powers, the mountains ruled the world. But these horns didn't rule the world, they ruled only different portions of the world, right? An extension of their world, the new world. Right, called America, right? Okay, let's go back in. The ten horns which you received received no kingdom as yet, right? See, that's what I just said. They didn't receive a kingdom, right? They have ten nations, which are small nations or small kingdoms, but they have received no kingdom, meaning the full uh fullness of being worldwide right as yet but they received power as kings one hour with who the beast these have one mind and shall give the power and strength unto who this next president which i believe the beast that was and is not, but is, can cover two folds. <laughs> I have to watch how I word things because they got these algorithms watching this channel like a dog. <laughs> uh, they might kick me off eventually. If I get, see, that's the thing. They, they block people from getting to this channel. I know that as a fact. No way in the world I got that many subscribers and only have. Right, how many people in here now? 14 people? No way in the world. I only got 14 people in, and I got 3,000 subscribers. Only 14 people in this room. You mean something? All the other, uh, 2,900 or whatever and, and 90 people or, or 80 people didn't get an announcement that I was, that we are live each week. So, you're not right. Okay. All right. So they have one mind shall give their power and strength to the beast. These shall make war with the lamb, right? But the lamb shall overcome them. Isn't that what it says in Daniel, right? That he's going to overthrow the kingdoms of this world. Mm -hmm. Revelation says the same thing. The kings of this world become the kings of, of right. And we shall reign him a thousand years. That's what's happening here, right? That's why the white supremacists are fighting because they are in prophecy and don't even realize that they're in prophecy, right? Now, um, let's go back in. These shall make war with the lamb and the lamb shall do what? Overcome them. For he is master, masters, king of kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. All three of those, right? Now here's the here's the kicker. This is this is what shows you that the seven mountains has absolutely nothing, nothing, nothing to do with Rome. Right? Okay. 
verse 15 says, he said to me, the waters, underline that, the waters which thou saw where the whore sits or sit it in King James English are peoples, right? Multitudes, nations, and tongues. Ooh. So the people, the seven kings and the eight all connect to the wisdom, the government, the world system that controls, right? People, multitude, nations, and tongues. That's what it is. They know their time is coming to a close. Mm -hmm. They know it. Even them that don't follow the Bible and know anything about prophecy, they they know they sense this coming for them, a change, a shift in power. That's why they want, that's correct, that's correct. That's why they want us to believe that the, got to watch these words, that the 2020 epidemic, I say it like that, that happened was created in a laboratory. It wasn't. It was judgment. It wasn't created in the laboratory. Laptop couldn't do that much damage on a global scale. Everywhere. Give give y'all his props. That's y'all orchestrating. Right? Powers that be can't do that. They don't have that kind of strength. Right? So the multitudes and the tongues, right? The ten horns which you saw upon the beast, these shall hate the whore. Right? And shall make her desolate and naked and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. Right? So now you got the 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 red the red beast. Let me show you something. We're gonna we're gonna connect, we're gonna type these loose ends right quick. I'm gonna show you something. We're gonna type these loose ends right quick. So if we go to uh Revelation 13, let's go to 13 right quick. Okay. Okay. We're going to look at 13. And I want to zoom in on. Oh, let's see. All right, let's just read verse one and just read down. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, right. having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. Mm. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, mm -hmm. and his feet were as the feet of a bear, mm -hmm. and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. Mm -hmm. And the dragon gave him power, and his seat and great authority. Mm -hmm. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshiped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. Right. And they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Right. And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. Right. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against Yah. Mm -hmm. to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them 
them that dwell in heaven. Okay. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. Right. And power was given unto him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Uh -huh, go ahead. If any man have an ear, let him hear. Read verse 10. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. Stop right there. Read that again. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. One more time. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. All right. And he that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. So that's a, that's a prophecy right there, right? Mm -hmm. So he that leads in captivity, that's Joel chapter 3, right? Okay. Must go into captivity. He that killed with the sword must be killed by the sword. That's Ezekiel. Talked about um, to be placed in Israel of graves called Ham and God, right? Mm -hmm. He said, tell the birds come and come to the supper, the, the supper uh, uh, of Yah. Revelation talks about the same thing, right? So now... This beast, if you go back, the beast that gave them power, if you go back to the to the chapter 12 before that, it tells you the beast's color. So go to chapter 12 and read verse 1 through 3. All right. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, and a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she, being with child, cried, travailing in birth, and pain to be delivered. Right. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, great having who? seven, a great red dragon. A great what dragon? Red dragon. Red dragon. Okay. Now. That's symbolism. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't have it on the screen. That's symbolism because why was Esau red? Right? So the, the false concept is that because Esau was red, that means that he was so-called white man. No, not at all. That's not, if that's the case, David was red. Was he a so-called white man too? So he was ready. Red. The red in this particular instance has to do with lawlessness, perdition, right? So that's why the dragon is red because why is he red? Because he was lawless against the most high. He wanted to exalt his throne above the throne of Yah. So in that instance, he embraced or he was the initiator of the doctrine of rebellion. So you have the Roman Catholic Church colors red, right? You have the Caucasoid race who goes under red, right? You have, uh, I'm going to show you something in a minute. You have the, um, everybody, um, hold that for a second. I think. Let me just continue. There appeared a wonder in heaven. Behold, a red dragon. Right? What I was going to say was, is that England's color is red. Roman's color is red. All the colors of the European nation, that's what I was getting ready to say, are red. Red represents bloodshed. Isn't that what Esau was prophesied? That he would live by the sword, die by the sword? That's the reason why people want to make so-called white man Esau, because at large, they live by the sword to conquer, right? Starting with Alexander the Greek, right? And so on and so forth, right? But that does not make them Esau because they live by the sword. Because the, the prophecy was that your theft would enlarge and Yah would enlarge your theft and he would dwell in the tents of Shem, right? And so that's what happened there. Now we're going to tie that, we're going to tie up the loose ends a little further. So the red color comes from East, not from Esau, from Satan. He is the author and the finisher of red. 
which means lawlessness, right? Okay, so the red dragon and tying it together had what? He had, did you read that part, having seven heads? You read that, right? Uh, I believe so. I didn't, well, okay. I didn't finish it out. Yeah, just read, just finish that out. Mm -hmm. Having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head. So let's tie them together. So let's tie all the nations together. You can't see that? Seven and ten. They're all being tied to Satan, to red, to lawlessness, the lawless one. That's who the red is. That's who's being judged in the end time, the lawless one, right? The daughters that are not written in the book are going to fall under the same judgment because there are some people that are in those nations that are in those lawless nations know that they're being led to the slaughter, being deceived. Those people in those nations are going to embrace. That's why. Um, say I will bring them down to the valley. Right. But you were getting ready to say something. Like I will that. say Revelation where he said all nations he saw after he counted 144,000. And he saw all nations and tongues and people. Right. Because in all those red nations that under the power of the lawless one, some of them are going to embrace this covenant of truth. Some of them already have. Mm -hmm. That's why they can't be Esau. Because Esau is, a, is it, it connects to lawlessness. Right? Now, so the red dragon had the ten, seven heads, ten horns, right? Seven crowns upon his head. I'll read verse four now. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven right. and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered right. for to devour her child as soon as it was born. Right. And she brought forth a man child who was to rule all nations who, with a who, rod. Who was to do what? Uh, who was to rule rule all, all nations, nations. Ru not just rule Israel rule all nations go ahead with a rod of iron right and her child was caught up unto Yah right. and to his throne right and the woman fled into the wilderness right where she had a place prepared of Yah that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score all days right, that's good now let's go to the Old Testament. We promised that we didn't get there yet, but now we're gonna go to let's go to Genesis three, right? Genesis three. Okay. All right. Genesis three, right? We're gonna start at verse. Who let's see. Okay. Let's start here. The woman said, then Yah said to the woman, verse 13. And Yah said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? Right. And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me. Who beguiled me? The serpent beguiled me. And what color was that serpent? Red. <laughs> <laughs> Why is he red? He's lawless. The lawless one. Mm -hmm. Shedding innocent blood. That's what red does. Red represents shedding of innocent blood. Okay, go ahead. And I did eat. Right. And Yah said unto the serpent, said unto who? The serpent. Unto who? The serpent. All right. Because that thou hast done this, right. thou art cursed above all cattle right. and above every beast of the field. Right. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, right. and thus shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. Now I got this from Mori Josiah. That's a twofold prophecy. That was a curse because the serpent, the literal serpent, we call a snake, walked on, on fours. I don't know if Josiah taught that part, but you know what I'm saying? He walked, mm -hmm. right? Uh, there's a belief that you're talking about the prehistoric days. He wasn't talking about like the little snake we see now, but it was more of like, like a Loch Ness monster type, okay. like a, right, that type of, uh, uh, those, 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 those species don't exist. They are extinct, right? So, um, that's a school of thought with that, okay? That that's a serpent was. So that's twofold. Then also, 
under the surface of that, the serpent represents, as we read in Revelation 13, that old serpent, the devil. <laughs> so he brings it twofold, right? Okay, go ahead. Verse 15, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. Hmm. It wait, wait, shall wait, wait, bruise. We missed that. We missed that. I'm going to put enmity between thee and the woman. Right? So we already defined who the woman was in Revelation. We went back. We're going backwards now. The woman represents the people of the covenant. Mm -hmm. Obedient, the law, obedient sons and daughters of the covenant, right? He's going to put enmity between thee, the serpent, right? Let's, 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 take, let's walk in now. I will put enmity between thee. Who's the thee? Satan, mm -hmm. the serpent. Yeah, the serpent and right? his children. Yeah. I will put enmity between the serpent and the woman. So this white supremacy is a fulfillment. We're going to show it to you in a second. We well, already showed it to you already, but we're going to amplify a little further. Right? The enmity, I will put enmity between the, the, between thee, which is Satan, right? The lawless one and the woman, right? which is the law, sons and daughters of the covenant that he chose a continuation from, from Seth down to Shem, down to Abraham, down to Isaac, down to Jacob, down to the 12 tribes of Israel, down to the nation that came under the banner of the house of Israel and the nation, right? That's the woman. Satan is the serpent that gave the woman lawlessness under the auspices of religion called Christianity. And so there he says, the Jeria where it says, between thy seed, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, read that part and stop there. And between thy seed and her seed. Stop. So now. Is don't take a brain socket, a brain, how you say it, rocket science, mm -hmm. scientists. scientists to know that women don't have seed. So it's a deeper meaning there. And we already amplified it in Revelation that that woman represents the people of the covenant, which was later on established under a one nation, right? Okay. So, he would cause enmity. That's why you Hebrew Israelites that teach the law are always going to have enmity against so-called Christian apologists. That's the enmity. That's why Volcan Malone is doing what he's doing, right? That's why, what's the lady name? The one that ir ir irritates you all the time? Miss mm. Titus. Mm. <laughs> And what's the other guy they the glasses that look like he looked like uh Obadiah the late Obadiah Israel. Uh I know who you're talking about, but I don't know. Um his name. Pastor Brown skin guy. Yeah, Pastor. Y'all know what I'm talking about, right? These people have risen to the occasion because they are in support of the serpent's doctrine, right? Now, I'm going I'm to I'm show you something else that's not in this lesson. I'm going to tie that. Remind me to tie that together, right? Okay. Between thy seed and her seed. So, this Satan seed, who is Satan's seed? Everybody don't want to obey Yah's law. As hard as it may be, hard pill to swallow. Whoever you yield your members to serve, right? Mm hmm that's who your master is. That's who you're serving. Well, if you won't obey Yah's law uh, by default, you're, you're the seed of the serpent. Uh-oh. Somebody didn't like that. Okay, now, 
So that's between the seed that he gives the serpent a seed. That's so profound. He said, I will put enmity between your seed, Satan. Satan didn't have a wife, did he? Yes, he did. It was his wife. The whore. <laughs> the religion yeah. of the whore is his wife. And through the whore and all before Christianity came into being, Satan had all these other wives that created all these strange children that was, was called spiritual bastards. Right? Mm -hmm. That's Satan's wife. That's the whore. Yes, his bride. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they, they, they talk in the church. The church will be the bride of Christ, right? No, church is not the bride of the Messiah. The, 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 call, the call out ones is the bride of Yah. Right? Now, That's another lesson. Okay, now, so the serpent has seed, and the the seed of disobedience. That's what old Paul says that too. He says the the children of disobedience. He connects them. The wrath of Yah comes upon the children, as the Colossians and Ephesians both says it. The wrath of Yah comes upon the children. Of Satan, which is the children of disobedience, mm -hmm. the seed of the serpent, right? And thy seed, and between thy seed and her seed, her, which means the obedient, right? It shall bruise thy head. The seed of the woman, right, is in constantly bruising the head. Of the lawless ones, that's why they can't understand why you used to be in the church. You need to, you need to get under covering. Come and who, what church do you belong to? You need to join our church so we can teach you the fallacies of the Bible, the fables, Esau's fables, <laughs> Esau's fables. That's what it is. Esau became representative of the father. Of the disobedient, he broke the brotherly covenant, right? So, so, so here, it, to me, it looks like the serpent is bruising. Amen. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. Right. It shall bruise his head. Shall bruise thy head. And you shall bruise his heel. Right. So his foot, our foot, is on his head. Mm -hmm. Right. The heel, and then two that ties into the heel. Um, oh, no, this it word. Yeah. Well, okay, okay. No, go ahead. We, we can I mean, make the serpent is bruise, bruising the head with his doctrine, bruising the head of the woman with his doctrines. It's the other way around because look at the subject matter. Who is he talking to? He's talking to the serpent, right? Mm -hmm. He said to the serpent, verse 14, he said unto the serpent, right? Because you have done this, curse. Above all cattle, up above the beast, let me put back on the screen. The beast of the field upon thy belly shall you go, and thus shall you eat all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you, that's the, that's the serpent, mm -hmm. and the woman, and between your seed, right, and her seed. And it shall bruise thy, which is who? The serpent. It shall bruise thy head. Right? And I know normally people do bruise the head of a snake. Right. Right. I don't know, it's just that word it there, just but the, but instead the, of brief, it seems like it's not referring to the woman. It seems well, like it's still re, it's referring to the serpent. Yeah, but 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 the subject, that's that's the subject True. is the serpent, right? So he's not talking to the woman right here, he's talking to the serpent. Because up here where he talked to the woman, he gave her 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 judgment, the little woman, and also that's spiritual. That's do that's that's twofold too. The woman's judgment, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It's twofold. It's not just 
the female woman, but the nation. All his judgment fall. It's a dual judgment, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so this this serpent is a dual judgment, right? And so because of that, he says that the the seed of the woman is going to bruise your head, and you will bruise his heel, right? You will, or you shall bruise his heel. Now, if you look at that, look at that in the Bible in basic English. I think do you have BBE? It probably break it down better, or you go to a go to a more simplistic. Mm -hmm. I'm good. I'm mean, good. I'm okay. Saying. Okay. Or you can look at the Brentons. You got the Brentons, don't you? See what Brenton says. I thought I saw Brent. Yeah, Brenton's right there. The verse is there. Verse uh, fifteen. Okay. Click on Brenton's. And what is go down to fifteen? Okay, read that. What does it say? And Yah said to the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and all the brutes of the earth, and thy breast on thy breast and belly thou shalt go, and thou shalt eat earth all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. He shall watch against thy head, and thou shalt watch against his heel. Okay, so he makes so he brings it clear, right? So who's the he there? The he is the seed of the woman, right? Because Israel is 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 in the nation uh, is symbolic of a woman, but here he makes the woman and the male gender in the. In the Brenton's version. I don't have Brenton's on this one here. I can download it, but okay. All right. Is it clear now? Yeah, it's clear. Okay. I mean, just the way they worded it, it, it. Well, you got to remember too, it's, it, it is not in the, in the, if you look at the, the King James Plus, right? It's not in there. Yeah, oh, I yes, mean, it is. It, it, it is in there. Okay. Anybody. Okay. No, it is in there. It is. To, the word, to, um, the word, it is who? Yeah, he. I mean, when you're trying to destroy your snake, you you definitely go aim for the head. Okay, all right. Let's get back in. Okay, so all right. So the sea shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Right now, he goes into verse sixteen, talks about the woman. And I will greatly multiply thy sorrow. And thy conception. So that woman, that's twofold because the woman is being Israel, okay, woman literally and woman Israel, sorrow is multiplied by sorrow and thy conception, right? In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, right? Isn't that what happens to the, 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 the sons and daughters of the covenant in this world? Mm -hmm. Right? Thy desire shall be to thy husband, right? And he shall rule over thee. In other words, we don't want to obey Yah, but Yah can rule over us anyway. Wife don't want to listen to the husband, but the husband can rule over you anyway. Why? Because the Most High made him to be the head. That's why Paul said, as Yah is the head of the Messiah, so is the man the head of the wife, right? So it's too full, right? Okay. I didn't mean to go into that lengthiness of it, but all right. Now, um, now I said I, I wanted to give you something. Okay, go back to Revelation. I'm, I haven't even got to my, my slides yet. Okay. Revelation, uh, I want to go to... Revelation 3. Okay, Revelation 3. And I think, it, what is it? The, the, the Assembly of Philadelphia. I think that's the one I want. Revelation 3. And... That's where it starts to change. Okay, I know it's two. It's two. Revelation two. I had the wrong chapters. Two. Okay, Revelation two. 
and let's start at 18. Revelation 2 and 18. Okay. And unto the angel of the church of in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of Yah, who have given his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. I know thy works, and charity, and service, and faith, and thy patience, and thy works, and the last to be more than the first. Right. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication, and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. That's good, right there. Now, let's stop here for a second. Let's look at this right quick. Um, those of you in the chat, you can respond if you can. What comes to mind when you hear Jezebel? You can say, she got a Jezebel. I hear a lot of Hebrews teach that too, but they, we did a lesson on this a couple of years ago to break down what Jezebel spirit is, right? And it's, and it's right in this verse. It's telling you what it is. But so what do we commonly hear people say when they say, uh, what's a Jezebel? Add Gino Jenna what a Jezebel spirit is. <laughs> a woman preaching in the pulpit. Oh, God ain't never called a woman to preach. She ain't no preacher. She's a Jezebel, right? But that's not what Jezebel is. Jezebel is not a woman preacher or a controlling woman. But that's what, right? And that what people use when they say Jezebel, or a woman that's got a lot of makeup on and jewelry. Mm -hmm. You know, she's a sedux, a sed how you say, it? seductress. She's seducing the men. She's batting her eyes. Cause isn't that what Jezebel did? She batted her eyes at Ahab. She painted her face. I painted her <laughs> face. You know, so that is the totality of what religion has made Jezebel be. But I like how in Revelation he spills it out. So let's, op let's open it up. She's a seducer. Right. So the woman, he said a few things that I have against you because you allowed the woman Jezebel, which called herself a prophetess. So the even there's not even the problem that she called herself a prophet. It's not that is not even the problem. She can be a prophetess. Right? We got prophetess in, in in the book of the law. Right? But what was the thing he had with him? He allowed Jezebel, which called her prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants, right? First off, we got to deal with something here. Who, who was Jezebel? Who was she, right? Let's do this real quick. All right, we're going to come back. Cause that basically gives you the answer, but we want to deal with, we want to deal with who, who Jezebel is, right? So let's go in here in first King, I think it is. Okay. Okay. Let's go to first King chapter 16. All right. And let's start at verse 29, right? Verse 29, we're going to be 29, 30 and 31. Right. Okay. And in the thirty and eighth year of Asa king of Yehuda began Ahab the son of Amri to reign over Israel. And Ahab the son of Amri reigned over Israel and Samaria twenty and two years. Right. And Ahab the son of Amri did evil in the sight of Yah above all that were before him. Right. And it came to pass as if 
as it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, mm -hmm. the son of Nebat, that he took to wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Zidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. There it is. So who was so who was Jezebel? Now, if you look at the actual, that's not her name in the Hebrew. Just just a little side note. Yeah. Uh, her name was Isabel, I believe it was. Oh. Let's see. Uh, yeah, Isabel. Hold on a second. Isabel, right? So going back in, she was a the daughter of the Zidonians, right? So the Zidonians were Canaanites. So remember what the Most High told Israel not to marry the Canaanites because they would turn their hearts away from Him. So that's what she is. She is symbolic of is Israelite who have embraced the covenant. We got some Israelites that went out there and got them some Gentile Hebrews, Hebrew with Gentile mindsets, and not eating the swine and everything. And they ain't sending the Shabbat. They're not keeping Yah's law, statutes, commandments. Right, because you went out, went off, and married an Israelite who had a Canaanite mindset, a heathenistic mindset, and now that she turned your heart away from Yah, or vice versa. We got some sisters that do the same thing, right? So Jezebel was a a Canaanite. Now, if we go back into Revelation. Now we can see why there was a rebuke. The same thing they did in 2 Kings chapter 17 when Israel was taken out of the land. They brought they brought the lowest people, made the lowest people to be priests. Mm -hmm. And the people was teaching them religion. God understands. You're not under the law. He understands. Right? That's the doctrine. Okay, let's go back in. That's what that's what that's what she did. So the daughter, he said, thou, verse 20, suffers the woman Isabel, which call herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants, my servants. Who's the servants? The people he called out. Mm -hmm. Israel. Mm -hmm. So she seduced my servants to commit fornication. Not having sex with a woman outside of marriage, because that's Christianity's definition of fornication. Right? Mm -hmm. The Christianity had made fornication be what adultery is. Right? So fornication is it says act the heart that is indulged in unlawful lusts of either sex. Now, so that's the Greek porn, porn, pornography, right? But and you look at fornication. Uh, let's do this real quick. Hold on a second. Too, though, it sounds like she appointed herself to the role of prophetess. Okay, let's see. Let's give you a real good example. Let's see. Let's go here real quick. Let's go to Second Second Corinthians twenty one and eleven. This is going to explain fornication, right? It's going to help somebody out. Second Corinthians, what? Second Chronicles, I'm sorry. Second Chronicles, chapter 21. Okay. This is going to help somebody out. 21 and 11. Right. That one verse. I'll go we'll read verse 10. Oh, that's even better. Okay. This is chapter 10 and 11. Mm -hmm. So the Edomites revolted from under the hand of uh, Judah unto this day. The same time also did Libna revolt from under his hand because he had forsaken the Elohim of his fathers. Right. Moreover, he made high places in the mountains of Judah and caused the inhabitants of Jerusalem to commit fornication and compelled Judah thereto. There you go. So for this fornication here. 
the worshiping of idols, idolatry. Right. You make in high places. And okay. So right, it says strange fire, strange deities. Okay, so this here it says to commit adultery. Okay. Commit now so there you so the word fornication in, in definition here is using the word adultery too. But but we see that it's not the same because this is talking about worshiping idols. Mm -hmm. In verse 13, it's uh, referring ahead. to the uh, fornication as, you know, to go whoring. Right. As you said, it's not pertaining to a sexual act. Right. Okay, now, to, just to clarify, let's go to Isaiah 23, Isaiah 23 to 17. Okay. So twenty three and seventeen, what does that say? And it shall come to pass after the end of seventy years that Yah will visit Tyre and shall turn to her higher and shall commit fornication with all the kingdoms of the world upon the face of the earth. So are they not having sex with everybody, right? Mm -mm. So that's fornication, right? All right, let's go. Let's go to another. Let's go to Ezekiel. Um, uh, Ezekiel sixteen and twenty six. go back to that. You said Ezekiel mm -hmm, sixteen and twenty six. Thou hast also committed fornication with, with the Egyptians, thy neighbors, great of flesh, and has increased thy whoredoms to provoke me to anger. Mm -hmm. uh, read the verse before that. Thou hast built thy high place at every head of the way, right. and has made thy beauty to be abhorred, and has opened thy feet to every one that passed by, and multiplied thy whoredoms. Right, there yeah, it is. Everybody, so everybody can come. Co let's coexist, right? So that's what fornication. That's fornication is. So now going back to Revelation, and so Jezebel did what? She seduced. The servants to commit fornication. And then to eat things, sacrifice unto idols. Right? So that's kind of like Christmas. Sitting your cookies out for Santa. Collecting the candy during Halloween and that, Easter. Thanksgiving, cooking that turkey, sacrifice to Thor mm -hmm. on Thor's Day, right? All that goes along with that. So in ignorance, we habitually, traditionally have participated in fornication, not realize, not really realize that it is, it is offer either thing to sacrifice unto the idol of Thor. Okay, read verse 21. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. Right. And I will kill her children with death, and all the congregation shall know that I, and all the assembly shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. Mm -hmm. But unto you, I say, and unto the rest in thy attire, as many as have not this doctrine and which have not known the depths of Satan as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden. That's good. Okay, so that's pretty much, um, and believe it or not, all that was an introduction. <laughs> All it was the introduction. But basically, the whole thing is that the lesson title says what? 
white supremacy, how did we get there? It basically is showing you, right? So we, we kind of answered the question already, but then that's from the spiritual aspect of it. But how do we get there from the secular aspect of it, right? So if we go into, go back into the book, uh, Sister Nell, Sister Nell told us that, let's see if I can pull this up on the screen here. Okay, Sister Nell told us in her book, this is page, oh, let's see, I'm looking at it. In the book, this is page, that's a digital copy. So this is page seventy two. Seventy two. So she says this particular man here, right, you see on the screen, who is John Fr Friedrich Blumenbach, names white people Caucasian. So he is the actual fulfillment of prophecy because this man here, Johann Friedrich Blumenbach, unified the ten toes under the label of Caucasian, right? And so she references. Uh, a book. Now, you can read this here. Since we're there, um, let's do this here. Let's put this on the slide. We're going to read a little bit this, then we're going to wrap it up for the day. Wrap up this series. This series, this, this, this lesson went a different direction, but I'm, a, I'm going to flow with the Ruach. And this is what he wanted me to you deal with so let's just keep it at that okay all right so you can see that on the screen this is johan friedrich blumenbach mm -hmm. okay. this is who he is who he was who he is Thank you. was a german physician naturalist uh physiologist, anthropologist, he is considered to be a main founder of zoology and anthropology as comparative scientific disciplines. He has been called the founder of racial classifications. Right. He was one of the first to explore the study of the human being as an aspect of natural history. His teachings in Comparative anatomy were applied to his classification of human races, of which he claimed there were five Caucasian, Mongolian, Malayan, Ethiopian, and American. He was a member of what modern historians called the Gottingen School of History. Mm -hmm. He is considered a pivotal figure in the development of physical anthropology, Blumenbach's peers considered him one of the greatest theorists of his day, and he was a mentor or influence on many of the next generation of German biologists, including Alexander von Humboldt. Right. Okay. Let's see. Let's see. Okay, there we go. Oh, I'll skip that one there. Let's see. Okay. Okay, read this read this right here. This is this is on this is on another page. I forget the page number, but just it's in the book. Just know it's in the book. Go ahead, read just read that. Barnum's Circassian slave girls all had white skin and very frizzy hair, giving them the appearance of light skinned Negroes. This combination reconciled conflicting American notions of beauty. 
that is whiteness and slavery that is Negro. See that? So it was through him that he made the distinction between the white beauty and the black slave. Okay. Now, where did he get that from? Okay. Blumenbach came up with what he called the Norma Verticalis. Right. Uh, adding skin color to the Nana Verticalis, he classified the single species of human beings into four and then five varieties. As we shall see, such meticulous measurement endowed the Caucasian variety with an un unimpeachable scientific pedigree. Mm -hmm. So he glorified. Now, if you see this one here in the middle, this is the Georgian skull of a female, a female Georgian, right? Now, he's the author of, of whiteness. So, uh, so it was at the turn of the century, which we read that where whiteness be, be, began to take formation and everything, uh, that was white was deemed as being beautiful. Right, but they got confused when they saw the slave girl with the white skin and frizzy hair. <laughs> <laughs> uh, How about that? All right, a little closer view of the skull. Okay, read that there. The difference between the Fulani, the Wulafa, the Mandingo, and how by the degrees of this difference they gradually approach the Moors and Arabs. And what is said about the Ethiopians is that they are closer to the apes than other men. Right. Okay, now, so that's quite a quote from this book called De Generis Humani Veritate on page 308. It's written in Latin. So now you can see a closer view of the skull here. It's on the right. That's the feminine Georgian skull. This is the one they call beautiful. So now, interesting that every white person, so-called white person, is supposed to have a skull like this. That's not even true. It's, um, that's been proven false. And on the, the left side, it's supposed to be the skull of the Ethiopian, right? Which he said was closer to the apes. When he said that, is he talking about the skull or is he talking about the appearance? The origin. So, so they're, what they're saying is they're attempting to say that that the 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 Negroes came from apes. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna sh we're gonna show you in a minute. Let's see if I can go to next slide. Okay, so this here is actually the book. As you can see on the left, is written in Latin, and this is the book cover. It was pro produced in 1795. So this is your origin. So this is where the spin. The spin began in the, the late 16th century. I'm sorry, 18th century. Get my centuries wrong. 18th century starts in 1701. Right? So the late 18th century was where there was a shift of things happening. Now, I got a book, which I'm not going to be able to do it in this series. Maybe next year we'll, 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 we'll start early and we'll get into some other stuff. But I have a book called The Tutors, The Black Tutors of England. Which Tudor, uh, Mary Tudor, which is the mother of King Iamus, or known as aka King James, right? King James translation, right? Uh, and where they said that she was a swarthy looking woman in the book. Um, she gave references. So the book is called The Tudors. The Tudors 
uh, the Black Tutors is what's called the Black Tutors, right? Okay, let's go to the next slide. So you can see closer up, and then so you got the Jord the feminine Georgian skull, and so Georgian means beautiful. So they even named the state Georgia. <laughs> The beautiful state, right? Uh, and here's the Ethiopian skull here, and here's the Ethiopian skull here again. And I can't tell what this one is. Oh, fluoratic. Okay, I can't make that out, but let's go to the next slide. Okay. Let's see, this book, The Negro of Beast, right? Is where they are saying that the Negro of Beast is saying that the Negroes weren't sons of Adam, but they were uh, from another race of people. Okay. I was going to pull something up out of that book, but let's just go to the next slide here. Okay. Okay, you can start. You can read right there. Like many other anthropologists, Blumenbach labels North Africans Caucasian. No problem there, at least not for the moment. But by placing the Caucasian varieties' eastern boundaries farther to the east than the Ural Mountains and as far south as uh, Ganges, Blumenbach enlarges Caucasian territory beyond the limits, then becoming accepted as European. Russia always a problem, was sometimes placed within, sometimes outside Europe. So, so basically, he's the one that's responsible for Egypt not being Africa, North North Africa being. Uh, a European Caucasian territory, right? Because you got to keep, you got to keep the narrative going, mm -hmm. right? Because all of that territory can't be black people because how can Egypt be black and, and so-called chosen people be white? After being in Egypt for 400, uh, well, not quite 400 years, but as it says, being in, in, at least 200 years enslaved in Egypt and came out of Egypt in a climate where they was forced to work in the fields <laughs> for 200 plus years but they were white I mean even people that don't believe we Israel have a problem with that. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, next slide right here. Go ahead. With the concept of human beauty as a scientifically certified racial trait, we come to a crucial turning point in the history of white people, now linking Caucasian firmly to beauty. Blumenbach remained divided of mind, holding first place in his classification was always a scientific measurement of skulls. But second, within human, within human variety came a concern for physical beauty, mm -hmm. going well beyond the beauty of skulls and giving birth to a powerful word in race thinking, Caucasian uh, variety. Mm -hmm. I have taken the name of this variety from Mount Caucasus, mm. both because its neighborhood and especially its southern slope produces the most beautiful race of men. Mm. I mean the Georgian. Most beautiful men. Mm. Most beautiful men. Isn't there something? Mm -hmm. Nobody more beautiful than that. So let's go to the next slide. Blumenbach labeled his prized skull beautiful and female Georgian, going on to call the human variety 
It inspired Caucasian, a mystery, a mysterious slippage he did not explain. Right. Oh, so why is that? Because every so-called white person didn't come from this female Georgian skull. But it held over as a pillar to represent all so-called white people as Caucasians, right? So we, we already know it's a fallacy in that whole doctrine. That's why there's no such thing as white people. But it's all an attempt to keep the so-called Negroes who are Israelites oppressed and in disobedience to the covenant, which is what we covered the first half. We dealt with the spiritual aspect of it. Okay, let's go to the next slide. In 1781, Blumenbach also returns to the problem of the Laps, finally admitting them as Europeans of Finnish origin, white in color, and it compared with the rest beautiful in form. Mm. As Europeans continue to discover ever more human communities, increasing numbers of peoples and their geographical boundaries aggravated the chaos of classification. Blumenbach revised once again. <laughs> <laughs> he had to do a revision, huh? He kept on with the false narrative, so he had to do revisions to keep. And see, see, this is the thing. Uh, people that Irish, oh, I, look, I, I don't have time in this series, but did you know there were black Irish? Before the white Irish, so-called white Irish came in there? Y'all ain't ready for that one, though. <laughs> I was like, Black Irish? And and sure enough, they have, they, they actually have records of that. Okay. And they were not in slavery. So we had to revisit a lot of our historical teaching because uh, every Black person that came into uh, North America wasn't enslaved either. That's true. That doesn't make you're not an Israelite, and that doesn't make Deuteronomy 28 a false prophecy, right? Because in Deuteronomy 30 does say some will be scattered and be driven, right? So everybody, some people scattered, some people came over here that predated uh and it's documented that came over into America that predated them kind of we kind of lean on, on to into our, our, our to our black history uh, mindset now, but before before Christopher Columbus, right? There's a book called "Before They Came Before Columbus." Explains that in the book. There was already Hebrew Israelites already here that wasn't enslaved, was not slave. They became enslaved when these classification of people got together and they realized that they were being the, the, the lower class whites, so-called white people, lowlanders were being oppressed by the elite. And because the elite oppressed them, right? That's when they, and it's in the book, we didn't get to that part, that part, but I'll give you the synopsis of it. So when they got to the point where they kind of did what Mr. Blumenbach did, made them feel better than the so-called black people. And so they rebel. It's called, it's, it's a historical time called Bacon's Rebellion. They rebelled against the elite. And so the least I tell you we're going to do. We, we, we're not going to go out in the fields and work. We're going to keep things in our power. So what we're going to do, we're going to give you some land and we're going to give you some, some, some of them black people and we're going to make them be your slaves. But all you're going to be our slaves. Global elite are the rich. The, the poor white people that they gave land to were their slaves. Just like the black people that they had working in the plantation was their slaves. Okay. So that's how it came about to be, right? So 
in America before be, they created the laws, because before they enslaved a people, everybody, it's, like I said, everybody that came into America didn't come on slave ships. Okay? We have to revisit that and teach it accurately, right? And like I said, that does not make Deuteronomy 28 false. Right? Okay. And maybe we'll cover some of that during this Black History Month. Okay. Yeah. So, so Blumenbach was instrumental in this false notion of whiteness and to continue, as it says, with his geographical chaos, right? Let's go to the next slide. Here you go. Blumenbach's idea of five varieties gained acceptance, but it was his introduction of aesthetic judgments into classification in 1795 that gave us the term Caucasian. Judgment based on feelings. Okay. That's what it is. So that's how we, we that's how we get Caucasian. On a false theory that all white people connect back to this Georgian skull, the beautiful skull. Okay. All right, go ahead. By 1795, 20 years had passed since the first publication of On the Natural Burrito of Mankind. In the interim, skin color, not heretofore the crucial factor for Blumenbach, had risen to play a large role. He now sees it necessary to rank skin color hierarchically, beginning, not surprisingly, with white believing it to be the oldest variety of man. He puts it in the first place. His reckoning includes a large dose of aesthetic reasoning led by the blush. He okay. could. All right, go ahead. The white color holds the first place, such as is that of most European peoples. Right. The redness of the cheeks in this variety is almost peculiar to all. At all events, it is but seldom to be seen in the rest. After white comes the yellow, olive tinge. Mm -hmm. olive then skin. third, copper color. Mm -hmm. Fourth is tawny, but saying last, the tawny black, up to almost a pitchy blackness or jet black. Right. Okay. Like the first and second editions, this third edition of On the Natural Variety of Mankind keeps on ascribing differences of skin color to climate and individual experience in non-Europeans as well as Europeans. Right. Caucasian variety, color white, cheeks rosy, hair brown or chestnut color, head subglobular, face oval, straight, its parts moderately defined, forehead smooth, nose narrow, slightly hooked, mouth small. The primary teeth placed perpendicularly to each jaw, the lips, especially the lower one, moderately open, the chin full and rounded. In general, that kind of appearance, which according to our opinion of symmetry, we consider most handsome and becoming. To this first variety belong the inhabitants of Europe, mm -hmm. except the Laps and the remaining descendants of the Finns, mm -hmm. and those of Eastern Asia, as far as the River Obi, mm -hmm. the Caspian Sea, and the Ganges, and lastly, those of North Africa. Mm -hmm. With the concept of human beauty as a scientifically certified racial trait, we come to a crucial turning point in the history of white people, now linking Caucasian firmly to beauty. Hmm. Blumenbach remained divided of mind. Mm -hmm. Caucasian variety, I have taken the name of this variety from Mount Caucasus, both because its neighborhood and its 
especially its southern slope, produces the most beautiful race of men. Mm. I mean, the Georgian. Mm. Read, that. read it already? Mm -hmm. Okay. Miners initially. Okay, so this, this is another another writer. So he's he's a, a contemporary to Blumenbach. Okay, Christopher Miners. Go ahead. Miners initially uh, posited a counterintuitive binary racial scheme whose strange two-way racial classification appears in Grundy B. Dare. It's a book. Don't worry about it. <laughs> published in 1785. Right. Tartar Caucasian divided into Celtic and Slavic and two Mongolian. Okay. The Tartar Caucasian was first and foremost the beautiful race. Mm. The Mongolian was the ugly race, mm. weak in body and spirit, bad and lacking in virtue mm. as characterized by the camels. Mm -hmm. Miners classifies Jews as Mongolian, mm. Asian, i.e. Asian, along with Armenians, Arabs, and Persians, all of whom Blumenbach defined as Caucasian. How about that? Miners makes his ugly Mongolian race dark-skinned, hmm. and he joined most of his German contemporaries in locating the ideal of human beauty in ancient Greece. But he adds immodestly, the Germans rival the Greeks in beauty and bodily strength. Hmm. In a series of articles vaunting the superiority of Germans among Europeans, Miners describes non-German Europeans' color as dirty white mm. and compares it unfavorably with the whitest, most blooming, and most delicate skin of the Germans. Mm. The early Germans he describes as taller, slimmer, stronger, and with more beautiful bodies than all the mm. remaining mm. peoples of the earth. Mm. Miners maintains following Tacitus, Tacitus, that Germans possess the prized quality of racial purity. Mm. By the late 18th century, Miners was making claims for stereotypical Nordic, uh, Nordic Rutonic attributes that some in the uh, academic world would echo for another hundred years. It is not surprising, therefore, that Miners later became the Nazis' favorite intellectual ancestor. <laughs> <laughs> In that previous verse, I'm like, this is... Who, who he looked like? Who he looked like, though? George? Like Donald Trump, don't he? Oh. In the face. Look at his face. Talking about George face George. of speeches. Well, go, <laughs> go ahead. It is not surprising, therefore, that Miners later became the Nazis' favorite intellectual ancestor for he knew his tacitus and built castles upon it it fr in phrases characteristic of 19th century teutomania minus describes germans possession of the whitest most blooming and most delicate skin the aryan nation huh? mm -hmm. the tallest and most beautiful men not only in Europe, but in all the entire the entire world, and a purity of blood, Pure blood. that made them the physical, the moral, and intellectual, intellectual superiors of everyone. Wow. Mm. That mental disease. Mm. Mm. <laughs> but y'all, Negroes in low life, you at the bottom. Some in Europe lapped up this super racist therapy theory. theory. As miners attracted a coterie of French counter revolutionaries. Super racist theory. In the late 1790s, including Jean Joseph Barry, whose history, Natural du Genre Humane, divided humanity into beautiful whites and ugly browns or blacks. Right. And Charles D. Villers, a correspondent with Madame Germain de Stahl mm -hmm. and an expert on Kant, Kant, Villers settled into uh, Gottlingen and studied with miners with his influence on the stale, the stall German racial theory moved west. If some of the men- oh, Wait a minute, so this is another writer. Uh, Charles Edward Chapman, and he wrote this 
1933. And it's in reference to colonial Hispanic America. Mm -hmm. And some of the men of these classes prospered. If some of the men of these classes prospered, or more likely, if the women advanced through marriage with a member of the white upper classes, they and their children proceeded to despise the lower groups from which they had come hmm. and endeavored to include themselves among the white Creoles, mm -hmm. not accepted on account of color or other social distinction, they might purchase a royal decree declaring them to be white. Mm, the royal decree. <laughs> uh, this reminds me of when I was in corporate America, it was... Uh, She was Latino, but she looked more European Latino. But she had a black fiance. And she had his pictures all over her cubicle. And the manager, he was, I don't know what he was. He was German, I think, but he was a young guy. And he, he, told her he wanted to see her at his office. He want, wanted to promote her. And she, she, told, she told the story. He told her she need to make some changes because he wants to promote her, but he can't promote her until she makes some changes. So she was like, what changes do I need to make? And so he was trying to be political about it and whatnot. Please don't advertise your family and stuff like that at work. Mm -hmm. Keep your family per business personal and just keep a professional environment at your desk. That's how he politically told her to take her black pictures of her black fiance down and all of that. She said, she told him, thanks, but no thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so in other words if you want to ex excel you have to purchase the royal decree of whiteness so I remember I could tell go from story to story when I was a corporate man you probably tell some stories too I remember it was a Hebrew unconscious Hebrew we, that's what we say Chicago unconscious Hebrew and she wanted to excel in her career. And so she ended up and she actually got busted. She ended up sleeping with the VP. He was married. <laughs> and the ad with the with how to say the ad insult the injury, she got pregnant. And it was a scandal. He got fired because they found out that he was he was dipping in the soup at work. <laughs> but they was trying to figure out how can we get rid of her because she was uh what's the word they use? Targeted by an upper management person, so she could have a lawsuit against the company if we get rid of her. So we got to figure out how we're going to handle this because she's actually the innocent party, but even though she, she was according to the company policy, you're not supposed to, uh, they don't, they frown on you dating somebody in the company, mm -hmm. especially somebody that's already married. Gentile has got a Gentile wife at home. So. Some kind of way they found out a way to give her a settlement. And she was going to. But well, she's probably living good. She's probably got a good settlement. You know? I'm sure the, the, the Gentile white probably left them. <laughs> kind of like that movie we saw with uh, Sanaa Lathan in it, where she, she was um, another guy playing Soul Food. And she was cheating on him with with the partner and and the partner bought all this stuff for her. I forget the name, the name of the movie. Long story short, she told her husband he wasn't, you know what, and I don't need you and I'm going, he loves me, all of that. But he ended up getting fired. 
and losing everything. He had to take the car back and everything. And then she came to him and told him and he told it was over. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what happens. So when you purchase the royal decree to declare yourself white, there's a lot of other stuff comes with that, right? All right, let's see. Let's, let's, let's wrap this up. Okay, where are we at? The Invention of White People. Readers of the first edition of The Invention of the White Race were startled, startled by Allen's bold assertion on the back cover. When the first Africans arrived in Virginia in 1619, there were no white people there, nor, according to the colonial records, would there be for another 60 years. Right. That statement based on 20 plus years of research in Virginia, Virginia's uh, colonial records reflected the fact that Allen found no instance of the official use of the word white as a token of social status prior to its appearance in a Virginia law passed in 1691. Mm -hmm. As he later explained others living in the colony at that time were English. They had been English when they left England, and naturally they and their Virginia-born children were English. They were not white. White identity had to be carefully taught, and it would be only after the passage of some six crucial decades that the word would appear as a synonym for European American. Mm. Mm -hmm. Isn't that something? Now, that's a white man that wrote that. Uh, the author of that book, let's see if I have it on the next page. No white people in Virginia for 60 the years. Invention, that's a quote from the book called The Invention of White People. Okay, so this one here, Nell Irvin Painter, her book is The History of White People. But this book is called The Invention. He goes in deep and I tell you how white class was invented. And that's where he goes into, she covers the Bacon's Rebellion and all of that period where they created these Jim Crow laws later on and to separate class. I remember coming up as a kid, uh, we, was, we were segregated. <laughs> when I was in elementary school, I think I was the class that went to middle school It was, they had co-ed, they had separate classes. The, the, the females had gym by themselves and the, and the males had physical education gym by itself. Really? Wow. I remember that. Yeah. So they had class, they, they had class separate and then they had race separate. They had, I came in after they broke that, that, segregation laws, right? Um, so I came the generation after the segregation laws. Okay. The desegregation laws. All right. So let's see. How many more slides do I have here? Okay, this is what I just talked about. Bacon's Rebellion. All right, go ahead. It is in the context of such findings that he offers his major thesis the white race was invented as a ruling class social control formation in response to labor solidarity as manifested in the later civil war stages of Bacon's Rebellion, 1676 to 1677. To this, he adds two important corollaries. The ruling elite, number one, the ruling elite in its own class interest deliberately instituted a system of racial privileges to define and maintain the white race. And number two, the consequences were not only ruinous to the interests of African Americans, they were also disastrous for European American workers whose class interests differed fundamentally from those of the ruling of the elite. Ruling elite. Mm -hmm. So it's like, just, just like for all y'all that's still in corporate America, and <laughs> he's working right next to somebody who's white, 
but they trying to keep you down and they're on the same level as you. But they're using their white card to keep pointing their finger at you to the upper management who are the elite. And the upper management don't care about neither one of you. All he, all he or she wants is to be able to keep the power that they got. So when you become a threat to their success, that's when you see the managers coming in. You know, this manager is not manageable. What that means is that you're not doing what we're telling you to do. We're trying to protect what we got. So if you are, are causing a problem and keeping the working class people down there, keeping things going good for us, we're going to have to move you out to somewhere, get rid of you or move you to another area where there's less friction because we try to stay up on the top. It's corporate America. So what they do is they do what they call, they call, it's called corporate pressure, right? It comes from top to the bottom. Corporations, the, the board of, of directors puts the heat on the upper higher directors and VP and the CEOs and the CFOs, right? They had a little board. I, I used to go to those beats. I know about it. I wasn't in the board, but I was a representative of the working people to kind of try to keep, to be a voice. And they would have them board meetings and they would always ask for somebody in the work, um, working class to represent in the board meetings. They didn't want nobody too vocal though. They just want somebody there just to say we had representing from the from the labor or the, from the salary employees, etc. Right. So they wouldn't invite the union people to that meeting. You had to be a salary person, non-union. Okay. So you go to those meetings. They had those meetings and they said this is the this is the rules and regulations. This is the corporate corporate views and rules. All right. We lay it out. Bam. Because this is gonna keep us on top. This gonna, they don't say that, but that's what this that's what it is. This gonna keep us on top. This gonna help me continue to pay for my my uh seven uh three quarter million house, etc. My half million, one one point five million dollar condo. So y'all gonna keep me in my condo. So they hire these people, these uh CEOs, CFOs, and all of that. Then they go down to your your uh your VPs and then your directors and your managers and your supervisors and then your your, your what they call union people that work what they call them uh union union reps and all of that uh the people I went to school for business administration that's how I never stuck okay so those are the people that's working so you got the corporate pressure the board put the pressure on the VPs the CEOs the CFOs the CFOs put the pressure on the VPs VPs put the pressure on the directors. Directors put the pressures on the managers. Managers put the pressure on the supervisors. Supervisors put the pressure on the workers. And the workers put the pressure on the paper. That's how it goes. So you working to keep them on top. But they're making you feel like that you've arrived, that you've accomplished some things because, oh, you got to, you're making 60, 70, maybe 80,000 a year, you're doing good. You got a good salary, right? Look at your boss and look at that, right? I used to ask that question all the time. How come my bonus is five, six thousand dollars, seven thousand dollars, and yours is twenty five thousand, fifty thousand? And you ain't doing nothing but just in the office all day long. And you come out, show your head how everybody doing. We got mandatory overtime and you put suckers on everybody's desk, right? But you supposed to be better. Then the people that you're managing when you just basically a babysitter to keep the people up top in their positions, making their money. Right? So that's what it is. Right? The ruling elite in his own class interests, say it again, the ruling elite in its own class interests deliberately instituted a system of racial privileges to define and maintain the white race 
the consequences were not only ruinous to the interests of African Americans, they were also disastrous for European American workers, right? Because like I said, they were on the same level as the people that they trying to keep down for the elite people. Hmm. You got something you wanna wanna elaborate on that? Okay. I think that's the last slide. Okay. That's it. Okay. Now. Real briefly, I'm gonna show you something. Uh This is the book, The Negro, A Beast. And if you go through this book and you type in apes, let me blow this up a little bit. There is a species of animal known as ape species. This species is, this is on page 353 of the book called the Negro beast or made in the image of God. There's a species of animal known as ape species. This species is composed of a number of races and embraces every ape from the loomer on the up to the, including the Negro, the genuine Negro. The loomer is one race of ape species. The baboon is another race of ape species. The gorilla is another race of ape species. The Negro is another race of ape species. And so on throughout the series. Mm -hmm. So, during the turn of the century is where Mr. Blumenbach and his cohorts all got together to formulate strategic, like it says in, in Psalms 83, they have taken crafty counsel, right? Let's read it. We're going to come to a close. We'll read a couple of scriptures and we'll close out. Psalms to Helam 83. All right. Eighty-three and verse three. They have taken crafty counsel against thy people and consulted against Help. thy hidden ones. Crafty counsel. So they take crafty counsel against the hidden ones. Okay, let me show you something. We're gonna tie this together, right? All right, let's go to Go to Isaiah. Wait, hold on. Hmm? Isaiah 42. That's what I want. 42. Okay, 42. And 22. But this is a people robbed and spoiled. They are all of them snared in holes, and they are hid in prison houses. They are for a prey and none delivereth, for a spoil and none saith restore. So hid, right? There it is. Hidden ones, right? Hidden prison houses and our prey, right? So prison is not just limited to a prison cell. <laughs> see, because you got to see the spiritual... You got to see the spiritual meaning behind that. 
All that we just told you is prison. Right? Mm -hmm. When you are in debt and you have to work, work, work to pay your debt, debt, debt. And sometimes you have to work jobs that you don't want to work because you got debt. And so you got to choose that position where you down at the bottom where you putting the pressure on the paper. Right? Um, hidden in prison houses, right? And so the prison houses are where you're not woke. That's why this, the system is against you being woke. They want you to stay in the prison house. I want you to be woke. Remember this, right? Always. Remember what the most I told, told Shemaiah. He said, what do you have in your hand, right? Always ask yourself that. You want to come out of where you are. What do you have in your hand? Right? In other words, what does that mean? Is what is it that the most have a ble has blessed you to do naturally that other people have to learn to do? That's where your bread and butter is. Okay. Mine is writing. And the enemy would love to trick me into going back into getting in the wheels of a truck again and spending all that time, right? And right now, this is the time where I'm I'm building and I'm compiling my notes and getting ready to release my first book. And I'm kind of leaning more towards the Esau book coming up on a close on that to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt indisputable that Esau is not the white man. Not. So all this hatred towards the so-called false narrative of whiteness, right? That's one of the reasons why we did this series. To prove to you that there is no such thing as white people. And once you wake up and realize that they, they lied to you and you you see, and even the people that have enabled or allowed themselves to benefit from the false label of white of whiteness wake up, they'll realize their life would be better. How could you be better than somebody you live next door to and work at the same job? But you're better than because you're white. That's the dumbest thing in the world. Don't let the elite keep you stuck on stupor, right? Because that's what that's what it is, stuck on stupor. Now, what I want to do, let's close with this here. Let's, let's close, let's close with a hot one, right? Um, let's go to Deuteronomy 30. Okay. Because the the doctrine of The doctrine of Jezebel, Esau, Satan, and anybody else that wants to challenge, because I, I got people, they want to challenge the Bible because Satan realized his time is short. And so they, they attempt to attack me or my, my Isha. By secretly attacking the Bible, but not going on the record saying, Oh, I don't believe in the Bible. You don't believe in the Bible? Just come come out and just say you don't believe in it. I know where I'm who I'm dealing with. I already know you don't believe in it, but you're afraid to acknowledge before your family, friends, and loved ones that you don't believe in the Bible because you won't want to be an outsider. Okay. All right. So Deuteronomy 30, verse 1. And it shall come to pass when all these things are come upon thee, the blessing and the curse right. which I have set before thee, and thou shalt call them to mind among all the nations, whither Yah thy Elohim have driven thee, 
and shall return unto Yah thy Elohim, and shall obey his voice according to all that I have commanded thee this day, right. thou and thy children, with all thine heart and with all thy soul, that then Yah thy Elohim will turn thy captivity and have compassion upon thee, and will return and gather thee from all the nations where the Yah thy Elohim have scattered thee. Mm. Well, so we got driven and scattered. Right? So first thirty verse one says, When Yah have driven thee, and that's the word Nada, which means to push off. And then uh where Yah have scattered thee, and the word scatter is puts, means dashed in pieces to disperse. That's that's slavery. That's the diaspora. So everybody wasn't puts somewhere puts and somewhere nadaf which is still Israel driven I did a series one time on that years ago driven led driven scattered and led Israel was driven scattered and led <laughs> Which be that some Israelites never taste the slavery because they were they were driven. When they saw the oppressor came, they was gone. They went somewhere else. Set up camp somewhere else, right? And look at people like the the, the Gullah Gichi. Right? That's a good, real good example of it. they set up their own community. Got away from the people, got away from the enslavers. Self sufficient community. Most I say, I'll make you a uh, sanctuary in the, in the lands where you come. We don't have to be in this system. We can be here and not be in this system, right? We can have everything that we need, right? All right, go ahead, finish it out. Uh, verse 4. If any of thine be driven out unto the outmost parts of heaven, from thence will Yah thy Elohim gather thee, and from thence will he fetch thee. Right. And Yah thy Elohim will bring thee into the land which thy fathers possessed, and thou shalt possess it, and he will do thee good and multiply thee above thy fathers. Right. And Yah thy Elohim will circumcise thine heart and the heart of thy seed, to love Yah, thy Elohim, with all thine heart and with all thy soul, that thou mayest live. And Yah, thy Elohim, will put all these curses upon thine enemies and on them that hate thee, which persecuted thee. Mm -hmm. And thou shalt return and obey the voice of Yah and do all his commandments, which I command thee this day. Mm -hmm. And Yah, thy Elohim, will make thee plenteous in every good work of thine hand and in the fruit of thy body and in the fruit of thy cattle and in the fruit of thy land for good. For Yah will again rejoice over thee for good as he rejoiced over thy fathers. Mm -hmm. That's good. So the Most High said, after we return to the covenant, verse 7, he said, I will put all these curses upon your enemies. Oh. So anybody that don't want me to know I'm an Israelite, say it don't matter. The curse is going to be on you. So you better change your heart. If you are a so-called white person and you you have a hatred towards the knowledge coming forth that these so-called Negroes that have been enslaved and oppressed, right, are not Israelites, you're going to be in slavery in the kingdom. Then you're going to know, right, like the most side said, right, you should know. That these are uh, people that I have loved. What is that? Isaiah.
of Jeremiah. No, that's not it. it. That's not the one I want. That's the one where they said, I will, you will drink the milk of the Gentiles. It's like Isaiah 60 or 61, maybe? Yeah, 60. That's it. 14, 60, 14. This is love, right? So when an Israelite is telling you, I'm giving you, I'm giving you a way out. You don't want to be a slave in the kingdom. Embrace Yah's people and help. Uh, and there's a sister that used to have a video. She said, I'm raised up to show Judah or Israel the so-called Negroes who they are. She is she still doing it? She's working on, on her getting out of jail free cards. <laughs> Well, if you want to keep the Negroes, Negroes, African Americans, the United Israelites, just just wait. Like Stephen A. Smith say, just wait. When the Messiah returns, your behind gonna be in slavery. Just like the book say. All right, Isaiah 60, 14. What is that? 14. 60, 60, 14. Verse 14. Mm -hmm. The sons also of them that afflicted thee shall come bending unto thee, and all they that despise thee shall bow themselves down at the soles of thy feet, and they shall call thee the city of Yah, uh, the Zion of the Kodesh one of Israel. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Whereas thou hast been forsaken and hated so that no man went through thee, I will make thee an eternal excellency, a joy of many generations. Mm -hmm. Keep reading. Thou shalt also suck the milk of the Gentiles right. and shalt suck the breast of kings. Right. And thou shalt know that I am Yah, thy Savior, thy Redeemer, the Mighty One of Yaakov. Go ahead. For brass I will bring gold, mm -hmm. and for iron I will bring silver, and for wood, brass. And for wood, brass, and for stones, iron, and I will also make thy officers peace and thy extractors or exactors righteousness. Violence shall no more be heard in thy land, wasting nor destruction within thy borders. Right. But thou shalt call thy walls salvation and thy gates praise. Right. The sun shall be no more thy light by day, neither for brightness shall the moon give light unto thee. But Yah shall be unto thee an everlasting light, and Yah thy kabod. Mm -hmm. The sun shall no more go down, neither shall thy moon withdraw itself. For Yah shall make thine everlasting light, and the days of thy mourning shall be ended. Mm -hmm. Thy people also shall all be righteous. They shall inherit the land forever, the branch of my planting, the work of my hands, that I might be glorified. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, no, that's good. One more. Okay. Uh, this, this is the one I was I was thinking about. This is Revelation, but I thought it was in. It's a specific phrase I was looking for, where it said, "The day will know that I have loved thee." Mm -hmm. And all oh, I have loved thee. That's Revelation three and nine. But I thought it was in Isaiah where he said, "It was too." I bow down. Anybody know where that's found at? I have loved thee. All the nations shall know. And it, it's, mm. What was it they? Uh, I might be. I might be using the wrong, the wrong phraseology. Mm -hmm. You said the one in Revelations, not the one you took before. Revelations 3, that's not it. Okay, we read um, we read Isaiah 49, right? When it said, Look, that I lick the dust off thy feet. Let's 
Did we read? Was it forty nine and twenty three? Did we read that? Okay. Okay. Yeah. I, I don't think we. Maybe this is the one I'm thinking about. If forty nine and twenty two. I think this might be one. Let's say, Yah, behold, I will lift up my hand unto the Gentiles and set up my stand unto the people. And they shall bring thy sons in their arms and daughters shall be carried upon their shoulders. And kings shall be thy nursing fathers and queens thy nursing mothers. They shall bow down to thee with their faces toward the earth and lick up the dust of thy feet. And thou shalt know that I am Yah, for they shall not be ashamed that wait for me. Okay, Revelation 3 9 says, um, I know thy works condemn to say they are the synagogue. Maybe I'm maybe I'm kind of mixing two at the same time. <laughs> okay, 3 9 says, Behold, okay, um, Elias Stone gave me Jeremiah 31 and uh, Malachi. Was that one and two? Let's see, and the revelation says, "Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they lie, and are Israelites, and are not, but do not lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee." Which one is that? It's Revelation three nine. Mm -hmm. And Elias Stone gave us Malachi one and two. Let's see. Now, okay, one, two. We, we're about to close. Let's see. Now, okay, one and two. I want to get as much in. I wanted to get as much in because this is the last on this particular subject for this for this time. We'll come back into it because there's a whole lot more we didn't cover. Uh, but you can't. I can't do the whole book. You know, two hour lessons from week to week. Wasn't my intention to do the whole book anyway. So Malachi one and two. Okay, but that's not the one. I probably I probably have a different. I probably have a different phrase. Uh, what, what's what's Jeremiah thirty one, thirty one thirty one. Okay, let's see. If, if this isn't it, then I'm gonna go ahead and you know shut it down. Brooke Shabbat, uh Code Deanna, good to see you, my sister. Uh sister from another mother. Let's see. Uh where are we at? Um oh Jeremiah said Jeremiah, right? He said 31. Thirty one and three. Okay. Now that wasn't the one, but behold the days comes I would no that's thirty one three, okay. I'm about thirty one. Thirty one three. Yah have appeared of all unto me, saying, I have loved thee with the everlasting love, therefore with the loving kindness have I drawn thee. No, it's the one where he said the nations. It's something about where he said he gonna bring them down before the nations. I think I'm kind of. I think I'm kind of getting a couple of verses tied together. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and close it down. Uh, Perhaps you all got something out of this series. Uh, go ahead and share. 
with the people. I'm going to do something a little different. Um, as time permits, I want to go back to doing some shorts, quick shorts, just quick to the point shorts. Um, it's less involved and you can say a little, a little something real quick. So, uh, I already have my shorts. TikTok is giving me some problems now because I posted Michael, Dr. Michael Brown and and they they took the video down for uh what is that plus uh hate speech and it wasn't even me talking it was him saying that he wasn't asking ass all right but that's gonna do it for the day brothers and sisters so um father we thank you for all those that came in today to join in this Shabbat lesson and we pray for all those that kept this, that are keeping this day, Shabbat, that you continue to be with them in their homes, the family, loved ones, and let the peace of Yahweh pass all comprehension, keep the hearts and minds to Yeshua the Messiah. We give you praise and honor. We say hallelujah. 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 Amen. All right, let's see. I don't want to change my. Oh, here we go.